Hello, my name is Matt Alexander and I am the senior pastor here at First Baptist Church of Greenville. Thank you for watching with us today. It is a joy to have you join us in worship. We're delighted that you've chosen to worship with us today. And it's my prayer that as you uh, worship through song, through the preaching of God's Word, that uh, God would speak to your heart today and do a work in your life. That together, uh, as, we, as we leave our time today, that we can uh, walk more fully in submission to the Holy Spirit through what God has done in our life. So again, thank you for joining us. No one wants evil to exist. It's ugly. It's uncomfortable. We would much prefer that people are simply products of their environment. A good, stable environment should produce good, stable people. But that is demonstrably false. We see the abuse, the lies, the hate, theft, language, and murder that surround us every day. And we are left with the obvious conclusion that evil is real. And it doesn't live very far away. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? This lurking enemy of our families, our world, and our own selves is not out there. It's in us. It's a part of us. And it's exemplified when Paul says, the good I want to do, I don't do. What a wretched man I am. The reality of evil is undeniable, and it's closer than we think. don't know how I feel every Sunday morning when I come to, to see you, to fellowship together, to worship here. First Baptist Church is a special place. I've told you before when we did the welcome one time, uh, Sharon and I were here for many years and I was called into the ministry and so it was kind of like being away from, from family. And uh, so we, we, I retire and come back and it's just exciting every Sunday to see each one of you, and it's, it's good to be here today to have the opportunity to bring the message. Um, this is the, the year, end of the year. Uh, we're facing 2020. Can you wrap your mind around that, 2020? I hope you could say that you've had a, a good year. Um, truth be known, most of us have been through storms. Some of them have blown pretty hard. Some of them really rocked our boat. You might find yourself at the end of this year crying out to God, God, why did you let this happen to me? God, I feel such loss. Maybe you've lost a loved one this year. And you don't understand why. Maybe you faced an illness. Maybe cancer has come into your life, and you and you you reach up to God and say, God, you know, why am I having to deal with this? Maybe it's family, maybe it's marriage, maybe it's problems with children or grandchildren. And you have asked God. Why? Well, there have been a few people over the last few weeks who knew that I was going to be preaching today, and inevitably somebody would say, well, what you got me preaching on, Park? And I, I, I would say, um, a theodicy. And I'd get puzzled looks like, you know, what is theodicy? And I, somebody would say, uh, the odyssey by Homer. I'd say, no, no, and... Uh, the Odyssey is a study of why a good God allows evil in the world. Have you wrestled over that? A lot of people ask that question. How could God let this happen? You know, we have to deal with tornadoes. Have to deal with flooding. Some people deal with earthquakes and tsunamis and bad things happen. And there are all manner of evil around the world. We have terrorism. We have where people will put a bomb on themselves and go into a public arena and, 
in the name of their God, blow themselves up. And we scratch our heads and we wonder, why? Why is this evil existing? They asked Jesus about this in a way, and I want to take you to this passage. Now, y'all heard me on this mic. Uh, Brother Matt always wears the new kind. Now, Alan tried to get me in that about 10 years ago, and I never could get it. I'm old school, so bear with me. Anyway, Luke chapter 13. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Then he told them a parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Why does God allow bad things to happen? I want to talk about that over the next few minutes. And um, first of all, let's talk about the place of evil in the world. Now, you know where evil began. You know where it entered into this world, don't you? Uh, we find it in the first part of the Bible. God created the heavens and the earth. He created the Garden of Eden place, first man and first woman there. It was a perfect place. There was no suffering. There was no pain. Everything was pristine. Everything was beautiful. Everything was wonderful. And you know what happened? Satan came in and tempted them. He tempted the woman. Did God really say not to eat of any of the trees of the garden? Of course, he had told them they could eat of any except for one. And Eve said, well, he said, he said that, and if you do, you, you will die. Dying thou shalt die, I think the Hebrew says. Surely you won't die. You'll be like God, knowing good from evil. And, and he tempted her, and she took that apple, or the fruit, it doesn't say apple, and ate of it and gave it to her husband. And sin entered in to the human race. The fall of mankind took place and affected all of creation. It's almost like sin became hardwired into our DNA. We are sinners by nature. We are sinners by choice. It's part of who we are. And because of that, all of this world is a, is a sin-sick world. And we suffer because of it. Sin became a part of creation. Now they asked Jesus uh, about this, and when, when Jesus was telling them, he, he mentioned the, the Tower of Siloam. There was this tower there that, that fell, and 18 people died. Now we don't know if there was an earthquake. We don't know if there was a tornado, or maybe it was a, a flaw in the design of the, of the tower. We don't know, but... But it did fall. There is, uh, you could call a natural uh, evil in the world. Uh, and just because we're a part of this sin-sick world, we have to deal with it. We have to deal with things like cancer, illness, disease, death. Romans uh, 
I guess it's Romans 8, that says that all creation groans. We have to deal with bad things happening in this world just because we're a part of this world. And that's something to remember, something to mark down. Sometimes bad things happen, no fault of your own. We're just part of this this sin-sick world, and bad things happen. But now on the other hand, there is a moral evil out there. There is a wicked wickedness, uh, an evil force that exists. They ask him about when Pilate had some of the worshipers killed. And evidently what had happened, Pilate had had some of his soldiers dress up as worshipers and enter into the temple and they slew some of the worshipers there. And their blood was mixed with the blood of the sacrifices. That was an evil. Some people open themselves up to Satan and their hearts are taken over. Back in the 30s and the 40s, there was a man that came on the world scene named Adolf Hitler. And he drugged this world into war. And millions upon millions of people died. Six million Jews died in the, in the camps there. There's an evil force out there. It's real. Somebody said the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. If you don't hear anything else I say today, uh, hear this. When something bad happens in your life, don't blame God. Too many times some disaster happens, some tragedy happens in a life, and and you'll find that person just shaking their fist at God and, and being mad at God. But you need to understand. There is an evil force in this world. God made us all free moral agents. He didn't make us robots. We have the freedom to choose. And with that freedom came the possibility of evil. We have an enemy. Satan is real. He is not the figment of somebody's imagination. He's not a cartoon character. He is so real. I know you probably know these passages of Scripture, but let me take you back to, uh, let's start off in Ezekiel and talk about this one who causes such trouble. In uh, Ezekiel 28, beginning in the middle of verse 12, You are the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, emerald, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day you were created, and they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you fill, the, fill, uh, fill with violence and, and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God. I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty. And you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. And then over in in Isaiah 14, let me read you a few of these verses. How have you fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn? You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly in in the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high God. Satan is real. I think we would be amazed if we could pull back the curtains and, and peek into the spirit realm right now. 
we would be amazed at the spiritual battles that are raging all around us. We would be amazed at the demonic activity that goes on. God has His holy angels out there. Satan is real and he has his demons. And by the way, we find in the book of Revelation, evidently when he fell, a third of the angels fell with him. And that it makes up the demonic host that you read about in Scripture and that we deal with day to day as they attack. Satan is always on the attack. Back in the book of Job, I'm not going to read you all of this passage, but there was a man, and by the way, if you're going through hard times, this is a good book to read. This man was, uh, he was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. And it goes through talking about all that he had. He had thousands of camels and sheep and livestock galore. He had seven sons and three daughters. He was a blessed man. And and one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them. Uh, the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming through the earth and going back and forth. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And then Satan says something like this. Well, he ought to. He ought to serve you. You put a protective hedge around him. You blessed him in every part of, your, of his life. If you take that hedge away, let me add him, he'll curse you. And you know that God allowed this to happen. And as you continue reading in this first chapter of Job, you'll find that one thing happened after another. I mean... Fire fell and destroyed this part of the livestock. Some, the enemy came and took this other part. And the, his sons and daughters were having a feast together. And a wind blew and the house fell and they all died. This man lost everything. But in all this, the Bible says he did not sin in what he said. But, but what we need to understand here, friends, is... Sometimes bad things happen just because we're a part of this sin sick world. Uh, no fault of your own. But sometimes you need to understand it's because we have an enemy. Satan is alive, uh, he is real. Well, let me give you a few principles. And uh, that's point number, number two. Um, some principles about suffering, why bad things happen. There is the principle of sowing and reaping. Sometimes things happen because of what we've done. Whatsoever a man soweth, so shall he reap. You've heard that before? I think this is a truth that there are too many church folk today who go out and sow their wild oats during the week and they come back to church on Sunday and they pray for a crop failure. We're supposed to be living for Christ. Now, it is true that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, but too often, too often somebody will be caught up in a lifestyle of sin and you confront them about it. And they say, well, it's okay because I go and, and I ask forgiveness and God forgives me. And then they go right back out and they do it again. And they just keep repeating this, this process over and over. Repentance, my friends, means to turn away. Repentance means to do an about face. You reap what you sow. And even though God is good and God forgives our sins there still may be a price to pay. There are too many examples of that. You know, from the teenage years, uh, teenagers may uh, do something stupid. Maybe there's a car accident. Maybe they've been drinking and, and uh, God forgives. But there may be um, uh, an injury that lasts a lifetime. There may be a loss of life. A real good example is King David. King David was a, a man after God's own heart. 
And there came a time when the kings would go off to war, and at this particular time, he stayed behind. His army went out there, and he stayed in his palace, and, and he went out one evening on his balcony, and he was looking over the city and saw a beautiful woman there who was bathing. And he arranged to have her brought to him, and long story short, there was an adulterous affair. A child was conceived, and you know the story. He tried everything to cover it up and eventually had her husband sent to the front line so he would be killed. Now David repented, as you read on through Scripture, and he was forgiven. But the Bible said that the sword never departed from his household. That baby that was born to them died. And one bad thing happened right after another, all through the course of his life after that. This applies personally, but I really wasn't going to get into it on this, in this message, but it also applies to a nation also. If we as a nation start turning our eyes away from things that are happening, sin that's being committed, if we overlook it, and then it becomes acceptable in our nation, and then we, maybe we legalize whatever that sin is, and then we promote it, and then as a nation we celebrate it, it won't be long until those who still call it sin will be persecuted. And if you don't think that will bring God's judgment, God will judge a nation who turns away from Him. There is a principle of sowing and reaping. Persecution, that's another principle. It says um, in 2 Timothy, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you live your life for Christ, if you take a stand for God, if you call good good and evil evil, you're going to make the world very uncomfortable. And the Bible says if you do that, you're going to suffer for it. Now, it may be little things along the way. It might be uh, some of your old friends don't include you anymore. You might not be invited to this event or that event. Those are little things, but you know there are brothers and sisters in Christ around this world who are dying for their faith. There are many thousands who have died this last year. We're blessed in this country. But you might be persecuted just because you love God. Uh, I think the pastor referred to it last week that... Uh, Jesus said, don't be surprised if the world hates you. It hated me first. Um, the servant is not greater than his master. Um, it, the world persecuted me. It'll persecute you. Now look, as we're talking about this, let me just kind of digress a moment and say, if you see somebody that's, that's really hurting, and one bad thing is happening to them right after another. Don't be like Job's friends. Do y'all remember that? As uh, the book of Job continues, uh, his, some of his old friends kind of gather around him, around the campfire, and uh, putting it in a nutshell, some of them say, uh, you're getting what you deserve. There's some hidden sin in your life, and God is punishing you, because of what you've done. Now, what is it that you've done? Don't be like Job's friends when you see somebody hurting. You know and understand what evil is all about. And you know about the enemy's attack. Now, there's also a principle of purification. It means nothing when I look at my watch. Uh, now, I, let me tell you a little side story here. You know, I, I've always said nobody ever complains about a short sermon. So, you know, I was determined I was going to get everybody out on time, and I was told, now, don't stop too soon. 
you know, because of the TV, uh, well, we'll do the best we can. Um, but anyway, uh, amen. I got an amen on that short sermon. Um, the principle of purification. Now you, we know that there's going to be suffering in life. Can't help it. Bad things are going to happen. Sickness, illness, death. These are things that we're going to have to deal with along the way. You can mark it down big and plain. It's going to happen. But the question is, can any good come out of this? In Romans, you know the verse that says, uh, all things work together for good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to His purpose. God can take even the bad things in life and He can turn them around and use them for our good and for His glory. Now, it's hard to get a hold of that when something bad is happening. But if you trust God through it, He'll bring us through uh, and, and it will be for our good, for His glory. You know, there's that picture in the Old Testament of the, the smelter. Uh, they would put the ore, the gold ore into the smelter and, uh, and heat it up and the impurities would rise to the surface and all of those impurities would be swept away. And that's, that's a picture of what happens in a person's life who loves God, who's going through hard times. God uses those hard times to, to uh, get rid of all those bad things in our life and get our, our attention on Him. Um, a couple of weeks ago in Sunday school, we were uh, talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you know that story too. Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a giant statue of himself made and he said, okay, when everybody, uh, everybody gather together and when the music starts playing, everybody bow down and worship the statue. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't do it. It made him so mad. He had that... that uh, Furnace uh, heated up and uh, had them thrown inside. And he looked. They were walking around in there. They weren't harmed. He jumped up and said, Did we not throw three in there? And I see four, and the fourth is like unto the Son of God. Remember this. When you're going through the fiery furnaces of life, know that Jesus is there with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. All of these things happen to help us grow in Christ. To help us become more and more like Jesus each and every day. All of these bad things. There's a parable of the, uh, of the vineyard. And, and uh, you know, Jesus says that all of the unproductive uh, limbs will be broken off. Now we can relate to that, those who have gardens or grew up around gardens and you have a tomato plant growing and you're training it to grow up straight and you, and you break off the suckers so that it'll produce more fruit. Um, that's how it is in life. You may have had a pear tree or peach tree in the yard and never did produce much fruit. And then maybe a storm came by and it split that tree. And often what happens is the next year it just goes crazy bearing fruit. Maybe that's what God is doing. Maybe that's why God allows these bad things to happen in your life. He's allowing that to happen to bring forth fruit in your life. Now, i tell you something else that you realize the older you get. I can say that now. And once I was young and I was sitting there, now I'm old. Um, as we experience more and more hurts and pains, as we begin to know more people over there on the other side than we know here, all of these hurts, all of these aches and pains all of the suffering makes us long for the promises of God. Makes us long for heaven. 
It directs our attention there, the place where we belong. Well, after Jesus deals with these two two things, he tells, tells a parable. And it's a parable about a fig tree. And the man, the owner of the garden, would come to that fig tree and it never had fruit on it. And he said to the gardener, he said, cut that thing down. There's no need in it taking up space. There's no need in it using up the soil. And the gardener said, Let's give it one more year. One more year. Let me tend to it and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. And if it brings forth more fruit, fine. And if it doesn't, cut it down. Now, friends, what if God is saying one more year? Of course, it could be just one more day. Are there things in your life that God has been showing you, that God has been convicting you about, and you just haven't responded to Him. Maybe it involves fruit. Maybe you know that there's a family member. Maybe you know a neighbor. Somebody in your circle of acquaintances that doesn't know Jesus. And you know that if they died this day, they would spend an eternity separated from God in a terrible place called hell. And God has convicted you about that. Maybe God is saying to you today at the end of this year, right at the precipice of a new year, one more year, are you willing to get it right with Him? Maybe it's something else. Maybe it has something to do with forgiveness. Maybe somebody has hurt you in this past year. Maybe you have not been able to forgive them. And God has convicted you about this. Is God saying to you, one more year? One more. One more day. Will you get it right? It may be a church issue. You may have been coming to worship here for a while. And God has convicted you that this is the place that you're supposed to be. It's a good place. I told you. Uh, it's so exciting to come together to worship God here and to fellowship here. And maybe God has been, He's been putting pressure on you saying, you need to take care of this. Maybe you need to move your membership. What if God is giving you a little more time to get that right? Maybe it is a faith issue. Friends, let me ask you, do you know that you know that you know that you are a child of God? Born again, heaven bound. You know without a doubt that if you were to die this day, you would go to heaven. Now, if you can't say yes to that, maybe God is convicting you. Maybe the Holy Spirit is moving in your life right now, and you know that you need to get it right because you never know if you have another day or another year. God is a patient God. And that is the, the last point. God is so patient with us. And the question of that tower really maybe should not be why did it fall on those 18, but why has it not already fallen on us? God loves you. He cares for you. If God is convicting your heart, don't put it off. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You. Thank You that You are such a loving God. Thank You for Your patience. Thank You for not giving up on us. Help us, Lord, to, to hear. Help us to listen to what You say to us and help us to, to act upon it. I pray that You would speak to hearts even now. 
And Lord, I pray that you would grant courage for people to act and respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching with us. I pray that God has, has spoken to your heart, has uh, met you where you are and taken you a little closer to Him by way of being in worship today. We here at First Baptist would love to know if we can minister to you in some way. Uh, please notice the contact information there. Reach out to us and uh, we would love to, to just meet your needs and serve you however that we can. So thank you for joining us. We hope that you uh, watch again soon.